Hello and welcome anyone who's listening into today's interview. Uh, this program today is made by Parallel Practice Unlimited, which is a joint venture between Slash, Other and Nissan Magazine, uh, where we investigate the current state of the architectural profession, as well as look into what an ideal practice could or should look like. Parallel Practice is part of the Scottish Architecture Fringe core program and is happening as we are recording this interview during the festival. The interview sessions that we are conducting are part of this temporary research practice and will ultimately be part of a sign that will be produced in response to the information we gather during the festival. Joining us today is Raymond Young, who will answer some questions about his unusual career path and give insight into his experiences as a practicing architect since the 70s. Raymond Young took his master's project at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow and turned it into his career, and through that saved whole communities and their associated buildings. Glasgow in the 60s and 70s was going through a radical phase of regeneration as part of the Bruce Plan, which intended for large part of parts of Glasgow to be demolished to make way for a new brave world. The consequences of this was the demolishing of existing turn-of-the-century buildings, also known as tenements, deemed to be unadaptable for modern society. One of the main issues was the drainage services in the buildings, as, it, as toilet facilities were often a shared affair between the flats of the buildings, serving several families at once. Raymond Jung was a key figure in pushing towards ha housing reform, which saw a rise of housing associations in Scotland. He also helped make sure that many of the ubiquitous tenement buildings, along with its associated communities, were preserved rather than demolished and displaced. In his book, Annie Slew, The Govern Origins of Scotland's Community-Based Housing Associations, you can find out more details about this part of the story of Glasgow. Thank you very much, Raymond, for joining us today, and we're delighted to have you with us. Uh, we've asked you to join us today as we find your career path inspiring in that it aimed to serve community from within rather than act as an uninformed belief best interest of it. Um, as a starting point, it would be really interesting to perhaps hear a bit more about your own background and what really drove you towards a career in architecture in the first place. Yes, my, well, my own background is that uh, I probably am one of the people that managed to talk their way into architecture rather than anything else. I, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do when I left school. Uh, but in fact, I left school with not enough hires to do anything other than to go and I, I went and worked as a wages clerk in the south of Scotland Electricity Board. And in, the wages clerk ha, had to wait an, on Monday until lunchtime, really, before he got a lot of work to do, because they had to get all the pay slips in. It was an old fashioned system. Remember, this is mm, near over 50 years ago. Uh, nearly 60 years ago, uh, when you know, people were paid weekly and all the rest of it. And so one day the boss said to me, Raymond, it's Monday morning, there must be something you can do. Stop doodling and away and find something to do. Or go and be an architect, he said. So at lunchtime I went to the careers office, as it was in those days, and I picked up some literature on being an architect. I knew a bit about it, but I didn't know terribly much. Uh, I then stopped off at the library on the way home and got a whole lot of architecture books out. Uh, went home, sat up all night and decided the next day I would apply to Strathclyde University to, be a, to, to do the architecture course. I then, so I, I got for an interview and Professor Frank Fielden, Freddie Fielden, uh, who was then the prof, he says to me, right, look, can I see your drawings? I said, no, I haven't done any drawings. I don't, don't know if I can draw anyway. He said, oh, that's okay. So he then went on and we started to look through the, thing, the various things in the application. And he says, oh, I, I see you uh, did drama at school. I said, yes. Uh, and we discovered we had both done, we had both performed the same parts in school plays. Well, then he then turned and said, I see you're reading a lot of architecture just now. I said, yes. And he said, what are you reading just now? I said, oh, heavens, I can't remember the name. It's a big, thick book about the architecture of England. And I can't remember who it's written by. He says, oh, I know that book. I can't remember the name either. Oh, look at the time. Mr. Young. I'll see you in October. And that was me into architecture. It was the strangest of strange applications, I have to say. <laughs> 
Uh, but um, I get in and uh, didn't get thrown out. Uh, I know that a lot of our first year failed the first year. I didn't fail the first year, didn't fail the second year. Third year, in those days, we did three years at university, and then we did a year of, we did a year of practical study somewhere, practical work at an office somewhere. Now, most people got a job in Glasgow or some adventurous people went to Edinburgh. There were five of us who were adventurous enough to go to Canada for a year. And we were, I worked for a firm of architects uh, called Sutherlin and Kelman, uh, who, did, who built office blocks and industrial units. And I did that for a year. Well, no, I didn't. For the first three weeks, uh, I had to practice my lettering because in those days in Canada, there was no, you know, it was all done on a drawing board. There were, uh, there were no stencils. You had to do it all in pencil and properly. And when they took my, looked at my, my writing at the time, they said, no, for the next three weeks, you're going to practice the alphabet. And I did uh, for most of it. It was great fun. Uh, but during that year, two things happened. One was that uh, Martin Luther King was shot. Uh, and I had been, I had connect, uh, family in, in America, in the, US, in the States, and they lived in Newark. And I went to visit Newark after MLK had been shot and was hor horrified by the housing conditions of the people there. And then in the middle, just not long before I came back, uh, I took a train trip up to Hudson Bay and visited a First Nation reservation. And there they were just almost on the Arctic Circle and their houses were made of one-eighth inch hardboard. No insulation, but <laughs> horrendous. And I came to the conclusion that there was something wrong with the way we were doing things. Uh, and that what we were doing, and what had been clear from the from looking at the North American stuff, uh, particularly uh, the inner city stuff in, in the United States, was that people weren't being given a say or having a, a, a control in their environment that people like what I was being trained to be was making decisions for them. And it came, hit me even more when I came back to Strathclyde. And I remember uh, reading a, an, an article in the uh, AJ about St. Catherine's College in Oxford, uh, which had been designed by Arne Jacobson. Now, I'm a great fan of Arne Jacobson's architecture, but I then discovered that he would not allow photographs to be taken unless all the curtains are in exactly the same position. And I thought, this is getting a bit ridiculous. Uh, are these buildings for people or are they really, are we, am I being trained to be somebody who uh, really was a bit of a sculptor and you had, and the occupants had to operate in my terms rather than me helping them to express their own building, their own wishes, their own living styles. Uh, in, in, in the way that, they, that, that, that I think we should. So I started to get a bit up, uh, concerned about this and decided that I would do some work on the question of, well, I called it design participation, about how people involved in their own design. Uh, and that was how we got to govern. I didn't get to govern or tenements because I wanted to do something about tenements. I actually was tenements. I decided you would start where people were living and see how we could help them improve their housing environment. And of course, when you started to talk to people in Govan, the first thing they would say was, well, we would like an inside bathroom, please. And we were looking at area, an area which had a 15 year life. 
you know, in terms of the comprehensive development area which they designed for Govan, they had decided it had been decided that these particular group of houses would not be dealt with until the end of the, the of the comprehensive development area, and that was to be 15 years on. And that meant that a child was going to grow up in a tenement flat in Govan uh, and not know what an inside toilet was until he was or she was 15. And that seemed, you know, so therefore the two things came together uh, in terms of tenement rehabilitation uh, and uh, participation. And it was out of that we developed uh, a whole, the whole business of community-based housing associations, community art. Effectively, we were doing community architecture. That's really interesting. And um, yeah, like as you've already started touching on, uh, you you decided to actually, as a master's project, uh, not only um, work with uh, the government community, but you actually moved into the community as well. Yeah. And uh, I was very fortunate, Tom, uh, Marcus, who was the prof at the, t the, the senior prof at the time. Tom says to me on re when I graduated, when I, my graduation was quite fun because uh, I had already moved into Govan. And that was the first thing. And one of the early things I did was get a flat in Govan and say, right, I'm here. Uh, and uh, I wandered around, got to know people. There was an organisation called the New Govan Society, uh, which had been involved in in the first participation in the design of the com comprehensive development area. Uh, and this was a period when uh, the, the concept of participation in the 1960s uh, was actually quite strong. You know, there was the whole business of the, uh, of the student revolutions, for example, in France, where the revolutions would go, je participe, tu participes, il participe, nous participons, vous participez, Il profiton, you know, and it was that kind of thing, uh, and, and there were people beginning in Glasgow even to say to the council, "Hold on, uh, we don't want you to do that. We would prefer you to do something else." Uh, and so, building on that, uh, the government had created this committee called the Skeffington Committee, uh, on which sat the deputy town clerk for Glasgow, Charlie Murdoch who uh, headed up his job to look after the planning and building site uh, of the Corporation of Glasgow Business. And so there was a kind of interest running around. Uh, there had then been the great storm in 1968, uh, when the roofs of, uh, uh, felt like the roofs of half of Glasgow disappeared. And so there had to be immobilized up a, a program to actually re-roof a lot of Glasgow. Uh, and a man that was put in charge of that was a guy called Theo Crombie, uh, who was, had come from a military background and he was absolutely superb uh, logistically. And he and I fell in with one another uh, because he was able to help at the council end and he would drag me into the council uh, and say to me, now just say what you're saying and then go. Uh, because, and I was effectively exhibit A, he would wheel me in. And in the meantime, I would get him down to govern to public meetings. And I would say, just you do what I'm asking you to do, uh, to tell them what you're doing, and then you go away and leave us. So we worked very well together, Theo and I. And I think that was a critical part of this process. Uh, and I'll come on to it later on, the whole question of relationships being critical in all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, I moved into Govan. Tom Marcus comes along after my graduation, which of course my, I had to do my part two, as it was in those days. Uh, they had to come to Govan to see it. So I had the examiners come down to, to Govan. Uh, I didn't, I, I, to this day, my final uh, drawings, I did, did do some drawings, but not very good. Uh, my final drawings were never hung up in in the School of Architecture, they were down in, in, in Govan. And in fact, when it got to my part three, uh, you know, the RIBA examiners for my part three had to come to Govan as well to see. So, it, and I have a, 
where I had uh, an envelope uh, that talked about the University of Strathclyde 925 Govan Road uh, as, a, as an example of the, an outpost of the university in Govan, which is what we were really were doing. And Tom Marcus comes along and he says to me, uh, what do you want to do when you graduate? And I said, well, I fancy going, thinking of going back to Canada at one point, but uh, I said also, I've been watching ships being built. I fancy going going sailing around the world and some ships for a few years. He said, well, if here's a student ship uh, for you from, uh, I want you to stay on. So that was it. Uh, Tom got me to stay on and, uh, and I did. I had this student ship, which was to lead to a master's. But to this day, I've never finished the master's. Uh, mm. uh, and uh, uh, there was a, another incident years and years later when it was just, Social Science Research Council grant I had. And uh, years later, I was having dinner with the, uh, the chair of the Social Science Research Council and a professor, uh, professor from Glasgow University. Uh, and a prof from Glasgow <coughs> said, excuse me, said to the chair of the, the council, uh, this is one of your failures, pointing to me. He says, how is it one of my failures? Your failure? He said, well, he got a grant from you to do a, to do a, a study, but he never actually completed it. And the guy pulled himself up. And there's am I having dinner with the failure? And then uh, the professor said, ah, but you've done 25,000 bathrooms in people's houses. Does that help? Uh, so that was, that was, that, that's my degree was 25,000 houses in, uh, in uh, and, and that was great uh, because that, that, that was really, but I have to say, this was not me. This was me as part of a team, it always has been. Uh, it was a, a, an interesting, there were students I can think of who, uh, who came with us, did various bits, I'm kind of a lazy sort, uh, and if I can get somebody else to do some of the work, then I will. Uh, but uh, they came down and as I say, it was a bit like university out on site. And I've always thought that that was one of the things that was good about it, uh, that it provided, if, if we had actually worked it through further, uh, assist became, was, was a, a, a research unit of the University of Strathclyde. And it was about action research and about community architecture. And of course, we ended up Although it started off in my flat, which I managed to get in Govan, we ended up with a shop, uh, which uh, we ran the, an architecture unit, an architecture practice out of, uh, with Jim Johnson, who was, then was the only really qualified person uh, in it. As, as ever. He had to be the project director, as we called it, and I was the project architect. And then there were a number of assistants uh, and we built up a little office uh, uh, providing architectural advice, uh, ran a series of projects. We also discovered, of course, that having a, an office like this in Govan was a great idea from other points of view. Uh, so out of this architect's office in the middle of Govan, there was a, a regular planning advisory service, the local authority, Council sent down pl planners every Friday to be able to give people advice on what was going on in the count in the area. We had legal aid. Uh, the, the, still, the govern uh, legal. Uh, I've forgotten the exact title. The govern legal aid unit started off in an architecture shop. Uh, we had uh, obviously councillors' surgeries. We had even MP surgeries in running from the shop uh, and it wasn't that big I mean they, these other things happened in the evening and the architects worked during the day but it became a focal point for all sorts of uh, things going on and therefore the architecture was not a kind of uh, a, a, an apart from the community it was here was a community that had an architect in the same way as they had the bank and the mm -hmm. same, or, or the factor, or, or the baker, or the butcher, you know, 
we were in that kind of partner part of the community uh, and, and we were regarded as people, you know, we were all long haired, we were all uh, pretty scruffy, uh, but they, they, they very much accepted us. Uh, and not only that, but actually came to, to, to see us as being part of the community. And I think there's an interesting issue there about it's not all architecture, you know. There were, there were, I've got a lot of pals who have been in the big firms or have done rural, but the, the smaller firms and the rural firms have that kind of connection to the local community, which I think is important. Hmm. And yeah. would you say, oh, sorry, Alisa, <laughs> I would just maybe ask as well with how the um, how the profession has kind of developed, would you say that it's more or less likely for that kind of more open, integrated with community practice to occur now uh, compared to then? I think it's probably all about the same. Uh, yeah. I don't think there's that much difference. Uh, there will be some, I mean, I've, as I say, I've got friends, a very good friend who was a senior partner in one of the big firms in Scotland, uh, did some of the big, his last few jobs were it? some of the big, big jobs. And uh, that was the same as the, there were big firms back in the 60s. Uh, but what I did find, though, was that one of the things that Assist effectively created over a period of time were new firms. People came, worked for an organisation like Assist, and then went on to set up their own practice. And often they would be working for housing associations as their primary. So they were working for communities. Uh, and I think it's never been really clarified uh, within, the, within the UK, the amount of community architecture that effectively takes place or has taken place in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK. I mean, there are clear examples elsewhere uh, of, of things like Macclesfield uh, uh, and the South Bank uh, and various other, but, but the, the, the amount that happened over the years of young architects uh, cutting their teeth on tenement improvement working for community-based housing associations has been quite remarkable. It's a good story to be told there sometime. Uh, and some really good, and some of the best architects uh, of certainly of my generation came through that route uh, uh, and have gone on to provide some you know some of the, the best prize winning stuff in Scotland has uh, has been has come through all of that housing associations in particular have been very good clients for a lot of people particularly at a time when money was not quite so tight as it is now but you know, community-based housing association, Government Hill, for example, has done some really remarkable uh, Reedvale Housing Association work, which is quite outstanding in many ways. Uh, and these are with local young architecture firms. In that context, your whole approach from your final year at university and later on, once you started practicing, was very interdisciplinary. So you were both looking at research, but you were also really applying this very practical side, going there. As you said, you didn't have your drawings exhibited at Strathclyde, but instead you made 25,000 uh, bathrooms. Would you say that this, firstly, how did that impact your ethos in assist as well, in terms of bringing all these different things together and focusing on architecture that's not for architects, but more so for the community? And do you think that prepared you better for um, for just the working world compared to other people that may have taken the more traditional route in that sense? Yeah, I wouldn't want to say that it, it was better. I would say it was a different route. And I think the critical thing about architecture is that it's a that architectural education is a hugely broad education. To come out as an architect after, what, five, seven years, depending on what courses you did, you've been through a whole range of things from, you know, science in one hand, engineering, 
you've been through sociological stuff, you've been through uh, climate change issues, you've been through green, you've been this, you've been that. There's a whole wide range of things that have actually impacted on you. So different people will come out and do different things with those skills. I mean, I, I sat, as it were, in an architect's office, really only from, well, 71 through to 74. Thereafter, I would I jump ship into the government uh, and was organizing things, but was always with the architecture there. And my career thereafter has gone on, you know, to be not so much hands-on architect, not sitting down and drawing or, des or designing stuff, but actually enabling others and working with others to enable architecture to take place. Uh, so that was, I mean, if you look at it, now, now, when I joined the Housing Corporation, what we were doing was setting up housing associations. Uh, and these community-based housing associations were then hiring architects. And what we were doing was ensuring that the kind of architects that the community-based housing associations were hiring were the kind who were prepared to recognise that committees of working people meet in the evening. And so they had to be prepared to do evening work uh, as well as day work. Uh, that they, and, and, so, and so a different breed. I mean, uh, uh, Tom Marcus and I ended up uh, in front of the GIA practice committee at one point in time because we were offering free architectural advice. Well, it was being paid for by the government in one way or another, you know, through grants and all the rest of it. But it was free to the, at the point of usage. You know, it was, it was that kind of thing. Uh, and we were offering that. And the profession was, you can't do that. You've got to charge fees. And, you know, and, and then we would say to them, but the kind of practice we're doing, the kind of work we're doing, how many of you are really interested in it? Uh, and you could see people drawing back uh, so that we... We, we got away with this quite happily. But then, as I say, we then created a, a, a new world. And in fact, fees clear, clearly, if you're going to create, it's fine in a pilot system to give everything for free. But in a, when, you, when it was actually turned into the uh, community-based housing associations as the client, then government money would pay proper fees for architects. And a lot of young architects started off in that way. Yeah, and when you're, because you're mentioning now the, the housing associations and uh, obviously at the moment we're going through a, um, a current housing crisis in, in the UK and yep. um, a se like severe decline in housing associations as well at the same time. Um, how, how do you see the architect's role in terms of like activism when it comes to the current housing crisis and having that close uh, connection that you had with the house or being yeah. part of housing associations, do you see that as a flaw uh, currently? No, I, I suspect what happens is that different things happen in different ways in different generations uh, and different people. I mean, not, I, mean, I had colleagues who uh, were at university with me, you know, architect colleagues, who then went into work for local authorities and uh, were building houses, you know, to, to rent. Uh, without a without a client a, a user client group, they were working with uh, you know the city architect was their client well, that kind of stuff. So that that was one end, uh, one group dealing with housing, and I was dealing. With, there were those who yes, um, the the whole campaigning issue is quite an interesting one, uh, and whether architects campaigning it sometimes look as if they're campaigning for their jobs. Uh, and that's, that sometimes is a problem. Uh, and I think actually it's about you know, not being as, not being up front as the architect, uh, being part of a bigger group, uh, being connected, for example, to shelter or, uh, you know, and, and so, so there are other ways of dealing with this. Uh, so, but, but, it, but on the other hand, some people find that, you know, Full lobbying is the best. I, I have to confess, you see, in 1974, when I joined the government, I then was inside 
as it were, rather than outside lobbying in. I was inside lobbying quietly inside, uh, and that, but and and being able to 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 get others to do a lot of the lobbying. One of the my favourite stories is of uh, people in housing associations, community housing associations in the, in the mid 70s, late 70s, wanting central heating, very sensible thing to do. Uh, so, you know, they went, did the big public you know, lobbying. They cycled down to London to, you know, to, because in those days there was no Scottish Parliament, but they cycled down to London to present their petition and, and made a bit of fuss. And while they were doing that, we were quietly in the background saying to the government, here are the statistics, here is what you need to do. And so the government was able to actually respond. So I think you know, lobbying is a, an interesting question uh, uh, because you can act, it's about what is it you're trying to achieve and there are different play, ways of playing this. So I, I've, always, I've been one of, I've been an insider rather than somebody standing around with placards. I've done the odd placard, but not very much. Usually for something quite different, like, like uh, anti-nuclear war, but that's, that's another. Um, you also mentioned, obviously, the route that you've taken is non-conventional in a sense, and uh, we were also wondering how the development of, did, did the development of assist take on the parameters of a conventional office and how did you work with um, how did you manage to work so closely with communities and also maintain a work-life balance now you mentioned that you gave free architectural um, advice uh, through the GI practice committee and also uh, that sometimes uh, you had to work during the evenings you know to work with the community how are you trying to strike that challenging balance between uh, making sure that you're an active part of the community, but also maintaining a, um, a necessary balance? <laughs> I think you're asking the wrong person about life-work balance. <laughs> yeah, my wife will tell you there's no such thing as life-work balance in me. Uh, I, 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 to be fair, I mean, uh, I lived in Govan for 20 years uh, and uh, was, you know, we're doing things like we, we ran a small arts festival. You know, we were doing other things as well. Uh, and it was, you know, you were part of the community. And as you were the local architect. Uh, and, you know, it's probably, it, 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 in some ways, it will sound old fashioned, you know, like the local doctor or the local, the, the local hide, you know, headmaster, all these kind of things. Yeah, we were just the other, we were the, the architect. Uh, but we also were involved there for, in other activities in the community and uh, life work balance is, is always, I think, a difficult one. You know, uh, I certainly, it, it never kind of struck me that, that I never kind of, I don't think I've ever kept a timesheet in my life. Uh, and certainly we'd never have charged, you know, we would never have done that. We do, we're doing other things as well. I think we're looking at this in the context of, um... At the moment, there are a lot of conversations uh, in the profession about overwork. Um, but in a sense, uh, for many architects or aspiring architects, this is the profession and this is your job, whereas the way you're explaining it, it's as if you're, it's your role within a community rather than just the job, because you're not doing it essentially for profit, you're doing it to benefit uh, okay. others as well. So is that the thing that maybe helped you Although, like you're saying, work-life balance is a difficult thing to strike. When life and work are one thing, you're a part of the community in the end. You're the, you're the local architect. But let's not forget, you know, we're still getting paid for the job. <laughs> we were getting paid a fairly good rate. You know, when I think what I was getting paid as, a, as an architect in Govan compared to people who are working in the shipyard in Govan, you know, uh, who had different skills, uh, you know, I couldn't rivet a ship for the life of my life, you know, or do, or build up those kind of things. Uh, and I was getting paid, you know, quite handsomely uh, compared to them. And so, you know, I think we've, we, it, there's, I don't want to make this sound romantic. You know, this was a job, but it also was a job within a community. You know, 
and but other people work, work in, in in similar kind of ways. You know, I know of architects who uh, uh, work a, a rural practice, and they're very much part of the community. Uh, you know, that's where they are, and they, they 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 they're part of other groups within the community. The same applies in a lot of suburbia. I mean, uh, a lot of architects, you know, have a small have a practice in in suburbia. They're part of the golf club. They're part of you know the, the, the all the other activities that go on. You know, they're on the PTA uh, and schools and all the rest of it. So it's and it's not glamorized. You know, the kind of working in a in, in a in a in a poorer community. Well, actually. It's a poorer, perhaps financially, but it's got other strengths which other communities may not have. But and it it's a choice. You know. um, yeah, and uh, following on from maybe like the challenges of uh, having a work-life balance, um, what would you say were the main challenges for you in your career to kind of really stay true to? Uh, your ethos of wanting to work not just for a community but with and within the community promotion i suppose is what we might describe it i mean we, i worked for i first went to work for for the housing corporation uh which because I, mean, I left assist in 74 i mean assist still goes on still exists uh, and has been through several reincarnations over the last period of the last 40 years, 40, nearly 50 years. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 it's, it's, and it's doing a, a good, it's doing a good job as far as I can see at the present moment of being, you know, working for community groups. It's still fundamentally working for community groups. I went to join the government and of course, you know, that, but that meant that I was, trying to, to make sure that the, the framework, the policy framework that enabled housing, the community-based housing associations in particular to keep going. Now, inevitably, you know, you get drawn in. I commuted from, Ed from Govan to Edinburgh for nearly 15 years, uh, you know, on the train every morning to go through to Edinburgh and then the train back at night. Uh, and then when we moved, when Scottish Homes were created and I came up here, uh, we, we, I, I commuted around the north of Scotland helping to develop smaller, you know, community, smaller organisations as well, effectively rural you know, community housing associations. So, uh, but clearly, you know, there's always, you know, you, you lose, to a certain extent, you lose your connection. Uh, I've always felt though that I wanted to get out and meet and in those years I went out and met community-based housing associations. My wife would tell you that uh, my life and work balance was, was even worse. The story of us coming to Perth is worth telling uh, because I had, when we, Housing Corporation was being merged with Scottish Special Housing Association, I spent weekends going around talking to community housing association groups about what was happening and why Scottish Homes was actually not such a bad idea for them. So I was talking to grassroots people, if you would put it that way, the whole time. And I came home one Sunday afternoon and my 12-year-old son said to me, don't you know that visitors to this house ring the doorbell before they come in? So there's a bit about work-life balance. Yeah. So, but I think actually that is important. I mean, in everything else I've done, I've always said that the most important thing you can do is actually to keep in touch with the user groups at the end of the day. Because mm -hmm. in housing, they're the people who don't, you know, I see. I don't like the words. I don't like the words uh, public housing because it reminds me of public toilets and other things you use, but you have no control over. Uh, it, but I prefer either affordable or social, but preferably affordable uh, because everybody needs affordable housing. It just depends. You know, 
if you're a millionaire, your affordable house probably, you know, se several se several millions in value. Yeah. And, and maybe, a nice way to look at language. Yeah, yeah, affordable housing. Affordable to me. Yeah. Um, speaking of frameworks and working for the government, um, a new catchphrase in the profession is the idea that the most ecologically and socially sustainable building is the one that's already been built. There's a campaign by the Architects Journal called Retro First at the moment, but this is not a new concept and your own practice has had a track record in um, looking at this. Yep. Um, and we were wondering, how did you manage to stay true to your ethos? And how do you think ethos in terms of that ecological and social uh, importance of the existing buildings as, a, as were the tenements in that case? And do you think the profession could get better in working with the communities rather than just follow profit and build a new? Yeah, there's, there's a couple of things in here that, are, that interest me. One is, yes, if we can, the best, you know, the, the, the embodied energy that there is in existing buildings is worth maintaining so long as that building actually provides the needs. And that's part of the question because, you know, there is about housing needs and, you know, there are concerns, even I've got concerns, about how tenements are, you know, in terms of space standards and in terms of, you know, the access, you know, how do they actually meet the needs of, of, of the mid 21st century, you know, is a, is a question, I think, that needs to be looked at. And there are also, to be fair, uh, a lot of buildings were not built with the intention of continuing on and on and on and on. A lot of Glasgow tenements were actually pretty poorly built. And you can go around and you can see where they've all been propped up in one way or other, the amount of extra stuff that's been stuck in the front to make stop the building from bowing outwards. Uh, you know, so th th there are issues in there about just how far. There's also issues about population growth, change and movement. So yes, you know, Torre Grain in, in outside Inverness as a, as a new community probably is needed uh, because of the population shifts that are taking place. Uh, and I certainly know here in Perth, uh, I've had a, a little interest in a place called Bertha Park which is a new, effectively a new community. Uh, and yes, you know, we do need extra accommodation, uh, particularly if, you've, if people are looking for bigger space, space to work from home. You know, I, I must confess, I think the last 15 months being in a tenement or in a high rise building with, with two or three children and trying to work from home must have been absolute hell uh, and so yes I can understand why people are saying I want a house with a garden I want a space where I can if I'm going to be working from home I want a garage that I can convert into an office or I can get away from from the rest so I think we've got to get again it's about balance it's about you know understanding understanding these pressures as well and often one of the things that amuses me because I was in the Sustainable Development Commission for a number of years. And I probably used more energy in those years traveling up and down to London and to meetings of the Sustainable Development Commission and elsewhere than I did any other time in my life. Uh, and I know I have a very dear friend who is uh, involved in Copenhagen on uh, on, on the whole issue of sustainability. Uh, and she flies all over the place because that's the way the business is done. Uh, so, you know, sometimes those who are preaching that we should do cut back and do this and do that, need to have a wee look in the mirror because I, 
I certainly had to when I was in sustainable development actually. And um, we, we have been wondering about um, uh, in terms of like how um, we are taught now about architecture um, compared to when perhaps you were taught how that has changed, but we could maybe add into that question as well, not just if you think that how architecture is taught has changed, do you think that uh, the the increased awareness of the climate crisis, um, like how, how well do you think that has been integrated into the education system or do you think that it's kind of it would have been more better when you were taught or has the awareness increased would you say? I, I don't think it was there when we were taught at all. <laughs> 50 odd years ago we really didn't think very much about this. Uh, you know, uh, we were taught in the 60s uh, to design new buildings uh, to think about grand schemes uh, and uh, I remember I remember one of our colleagues who uh, we were asked to design a house for a company director on the shores of Loch Lomond you know that there's just a whole series of things in there you wouldn't be asked to do today uh, and uh, she designed a very simple uh, very very simple low building and, and which took them took us as inspiration uh, local cottages and she was told that that wasn't bright that, that wasn't architectural enough for her she should design something different so you know it, 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 I, I don't know enough about modern architecture and education but I mean I do know that there are certain things I think in terms of architectural education that I would like to see if there were if, if I was around one is to do uh, some more practical stuff. My, the best lecture I ever had on plumbing was from the plumber in Govan. I had followed the rules, I'd followed all the design, I put it all right in. And he said, Tommy says to me, laddie, come and spend a day with me, see what we need to do. I learned plumbing that way. And I, I, I've always liked the Japanese system. And I thought that was out in Japan years ago. And we're looking at architectural education there. And every year, you cannot graduate without having first built a timber structure. And you need to understand all the joints. You need to be able to know the wood properly. I didn't know one bit of wood from the other uh, when I left Strathclyde. You know, the practical stuff of actually how you put a building together uh, is, is absolutely fundamental. And in Japan, what they do is the whole year is taken out to a, to a town and they work with the community to do something that's to, and one of the ones I saw was this arcade it was timber arcade that was built right along the outside the shops and I thought this is brilliant uh, so there's that I'm not sure how much you get these days you can tell me how much do you get about relationship building because it's very fun. limited we'd say probably probably very limited um, yeah I think it, it's absolutely critical if you look at a good project, it's because the client and the architect understand each other to begin with. Particularly the architect understands the client and understands the needs of the client and understands the client's background and all the rest of it and therefore works with the client to help the client produce the building the client really wants, but probably thinks about that the architect adds things that the client never even thought about. And that's part of the skill of the architect is to come in and see how we can do it. How about trying this? How about trying that? Uh, and then, of course, delivering it on time and on budget. So that's a, a good question about understanding that. Most, most of the things I designed when I was at university had absolutely no budgetary implication at all. 
So, I mean, I think there's a budgetary issue there. Uh, what was the other? So there was, those two I think are important. I mean, I think working with clients, understanding you know, that client relationship stuff is very important. Uh, so I don't know what, whether those are things that are part of today's training or not. Mm, probably not, 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 not particularly. Um, it seems like there is a big, big split between education and practice, in a sense, um, which you can tell once, uh, once you graduate and once you hear stories of people like yourself who combined all of these different things together. And in that, in that context, we're also wondering whether, in hindsight, would you say that your route towards your career uh, was non-traditional? Yes, clearly not traditional. <laughs> I had colleagues at, uni at university who had decided they were going to be an architect when they age of 10 kind of thing, you know, and the, their life, they, they, so they went into the unit school, they did technical drawing, they uh, did art, they did all those kind of things. I didn't, none of that. Uh, so and I still, yeah, I, I can draw plans, obviously, but... Uh, you know, I can't get me to do a, a good sketch. No, thank you very much. And I've actually realised that very few people nowadays actually sit down and sketch. That all this CAD stuff, you know, you, you can get your fly-throughs and all the rest of it without actually having to, to draw, draw a perspective hardly about it. And there's uh, I have a very, very good friend who was the... Uh, one of his last projects was to do the Shetland Museum. And uh, I went up for the opening and uh, was absolutely over the moon to discover that the floor plans in the leaflet they hand out had been hand drawn by Angus uh, because it was not done by a CAD machine. And it was really quite beautiful. I think there is nothing finer than a nice set, a, a properly done drawing. Uh, it just is a, a charming thing to have. So, uh, CAD's very useful, there's no doubt about it. Uh, yeah, very, very useful. And speed up the process as well. Maybe uh, moving on from that, do you think that um, there is such a thing as like an ideal architect or an ideal way of practicing architecture, seeing as you you say yourself you've done quite a non-traditional route, would you say that that is an ideal way of doing it or? Um... For, some, for some people, yes, for other people, no. And I think that's the problem, that's the issue. Uh, there's no such thing as a perfect way of doing it. What there is is the variety, and you need to find your own your own way of doing it. And some people will do uh, the Zaha Hadid approach to life, or, or the Arne Jacobson uh, approach, where you know every all the Charles Rennie Macintosh is exactly the same, but everything is done to the finest detail is done by the designer, and it's done in a big way, and you're doing that internationally, and you're running dropping a project here and a project there. That's fine. That's for some people. Uh, for a lot of people, there'll be a middle-sized practice, you know, uh, doing a variety of interesting, sometimes often not very exciting projects, as I did when I was with Sir and Kiln. Perfectly good a firm of architects doing, you know, office blocks that satisfied the needs of, of, the, of the client there. Or people ending up like me doing something quite different. But I, I think you know, it's a variety of things. And that's what architecture training is great for. It gives you that kind of grounding to enable you to do all sorts of things. And how, like, in terms of um, you, yourself and your roots, it feels like you kind of found your roots so quickly as well, like in, in that you uh, got yourself involved in the way you did at master stage and then continue that and how how important would you say that that's been for you like that you had that experience at the very early stage oh, absolutely fundamental fundamental i mean 
I don't know where it would be. I, I don't know. I never had a career plan. That's the other thing. I mean, I've never had a career plan in my life, but things have just happened, happened to me. I mean, uh, and, and that was even after I, was, I retired the, the, uh, from the civil service when, when I was 51. You know, and that was tw 24 years ago. And since then, I've done all sorts of things. I've been in the government advisory bodies. I've, uh, I've, for about eight years, I was backwards and forwards to Denmark, helping uh, with urban regeneration projects in Copenhagen. Uh, uh, not doing anything other than sitting as a company shrink, as I called it. I said, I'm your company shrink. I come along here every three months or so and uh, sit you all down for two or three days and you tell me where you've got to, you tell me the problems, we talk them through and you tell me where we're going to go for the next few months and I come back and say, how are we doing? And they were great. That was a great way of doing things. So, you know, I've done that. And then, you know, suddenly discovered that somebody phoned me up and said, I want you to apply for the Chair of Architecture and Design Scotland. So, okay, we'll see what happens. Take your hat in the ring. And you become it. And then out of that, you say, mm, I think there should be better connection with Historic Environment, Historic Scotland, or now HES. And uh, so you got onto the board of that for a period of time. Never planned it, just happened. But that's the way it's gone. You know? uh, so I, 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 I'm very disappointing to people who want to say, well, how did you, you know, did you plan all this? I said, no, no plans. Don't bother, don't, just see what happens. Uh, you know, that's it. You know, and, uh, I think this was great insight to see how uh, reacting to situations is very beneficial and how your career path can really take you on a, on a larger role that is important to the development of the community rather than your own soul development as, uh, as an architect where you've tried to really um, take your knowledge, take your experience, take your practical experience and apply it um, and make sure that this is in line with what the community really needs. Yeah. Um, and this was really inspiring and insightful to hear more about. Yeah, but, but as I say, that's my route. Other people will go down the ha -ha -deed, the <laughs> ha -ha -deed route uh, or other people will go down other bigger routes and, and you know, it, it just depends what, what, how you, how you approach it. Uh, you know, I soon began to realize in Canada, I was not going to be able to design opera houses. Much as I love opera houses, uh, I was not going to be able to design them. Uh, it was not my skill. And let's time for something else. This is one of the things that we're hoping to interrogate with uh, this project. Really, what's a route towards towards the profession would be from education to practice. Um, and it was really great to hear your, um, your route and your opinion. Yeah, especially like that, um, that maybe there's need to, I think many people have a very strong preconceived idea as well of what the architect is or what kind of role the architect should take and give, getting even uh, people who get into the um, education of architecture in the first place they do it because you have this idea of what they think architecture is but uh, you saying that you didn't really have any preconceived ideas before you went in has maybe also helped you to just go with the flow and follow your instincts a bit more perhaps rather than have this idea of where you're meant to be or, um, mm -hmm. yeah yeah if you do that you're never quite sure what's going to happen you know, and it could be quite exciting. I suppose it all could have gone belly up and could have been an absolute disaster. Uh, but, you know, so far, so good. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much for this. Uh, and to everyone tuning in, this was our first episode of Parallel oh, Practice Unlimited with Raymond Young. <laughs>